Welcome to Windsor Teaches Ancient History. In this video, we are going to be discussing the origins of the Republic post, ousting Superbus, what happens next. So the key thing that we covered in the last video was the violent sexual assault of a Roman noblewoman by the name of Lucretia. The attack of Lucretia is especially tragic for three that I can count main reasons. One, the perfection and relative innocence of Lucretia as a Roman woman. She did exactly what it was that Roman society required of her. She stayed at home, she wasn't drinking, she was weaving at the loom, like all ideal Roman women should. And so she was not deserving of the treatment that she got. Another point of tragedy of this story is the abuse of power by Superbus's son, Sextus. And finally, we get a strange and tantalising insight into the Roman world and the patriarchal society that it was. She felt that in order to regain some of her dignity, uh, and she also felt that she was partially to blame for the attack, and as a result, to claw back some of the dignity that she had lost, she felt the need to take her own life after having called her husband Collatinus and her father Spurius Lucretius to her after the attack. The Romans were suitably incensed by this to oust Superbus, his son Sextus, and Superbus's wife Tullia left the city of her own accord. Sextus goes to the city of Gabi, which he initially conquered through espionage spying. Uh, he took it down from within and he returns there, thinking he will find a safe haven. But he was assassinated not long after. Another key thing is that Superbus goes to his kinsmen, the Etruscans, mainly the Veii and the Tarquini. In the direct aftermath of the ousting of Superbus, the murder of Sextus and Gabi, and the fleeing of Tullia from the city, four main names come to the fore in the story of Rome's beginning. They are Collatinus, who is Lucretius' husband. Lucius Junius Brutus, who is the royal bodyguard, from whom the assassin of Julius Caesar would claim descent. Publius Valerius, who is a Roman aristocrat. And finally, Spurius Lucretius, Lucretius' father and prefect to the city. Spurius Lucretius' job as the first prefect of the city to call the city's first elections. Brutus and Collatinus are elected as the first consuls of Rome. However, Collatinus is forced to give up his office as he is from the same family line as Superbus the Tarquini. Brutus has two stepsons, they're called Titus and Tiberius, and they collude with Superbus in order to take over the city and give it a king again. They are found out and they are duly executed, and any other co conspirators are thrown into prison. At this point, we see just how taboo any mention of kings has become since the ousting of Tarquinius Superbus, his son Sextus, and his wife Tullia. Meanwhile, while the fledgling Roman Republic is just beginning to find its feet, Tarquinius Superbus has got to find other allies to collude with in order to get back onto the Roman throne. He goes to his kinsmen in Etruria, uh, the city of Tarquini and Ve Veii. This is uh, where it is today, and in 1922, the town was given back its Etruscan name, Tarquini, in order to note its heritage, its Etruscan heritage. The Veii and the Tarquini see benefit in joining up again with Tarquini's superbus. They think it would be beneficial to see an Etruscan king on the throne of Rome, and so they agree to help out their kinsman superbus. What ensues now is, battle, is the Battle of Silver Asia, one of the first battles that Superbus and the Etruscans are going to fight against the fledgling Roman Republic, or in other words, the Romano-Etruscan Wars. Now, the thing is with the Battle of Silver Asia is there is a strange and spooky symmetry about the entire thing, which calls into question the report that we're given about it by Livy. The Battle of Silver Asia, the name Silver indicates a forest or woodland. On the Etruscan side, we have Superbus commanding the infantry and Arons commanding the cavalry. On the Roman side, we have Valerius commanding the infantry and Brutus commanding the cavalry. 
There's quite a lot of symmetry to this battle. Arons and Brutus both charge at each other and they are both impaled on each other's spears. At exactly the same moment, they both die. At this moment, Brutus dies as a martyr for the cause of the Roman Republic against the tyrannical onslaughts of the previous Roman kings and the Etruscans. He dies in order so that the Roman Republic can continue. Not only this, but it's said that the left-hand sides, the left wings of both of the armies are victorious, while the right wings of both armies are defeated. The Veii are scattered, but the Etruscans retreat. It's said that the battle was very, very close. In fact, too close to call. So much so that we're told in the story that there is a voice that's heard from the woods after the first day of battle. The voice of the woodland god Silvanus. Silvanus says that because one more Etruscan soldier died in the battle line, it was the Romans' victory. It seems very strange that it is Silvanus that has to ratify the victory. Why is this involved in the story? Well, my perception is that the story of Rome has to have been difficult in order for it to achieve glory. The new fledgling republic has to fight tooth and nail for its existence. If it were an easy win, there would not be so much glory in it for Valerius, Brutus, Lucretius and Collatinus as the first heroes of the early Roman Republic. Returns to the city victorious while Brutus has died as a martyr for the cause of the Roman Republic and their victory has been ratified also by divine entity Silvanus, the god of the woodland. However, upon returning to Rome, there is a rumour circulating that Valerius wants to make himself king. We know by this point that the word king has become deeply taboo. The reason why they think he wants to make himself king is because he has begun, he has begun building himself an opulent villa in the city. Overnight, he orders for the villa to be torn down and he decides to live in a modest house instead. This goes to show us that even outward displays of wealth could be seen as kingly behaviour and therefore is to be avoided at all costs. To sweeten the deal, Publius Valerius also puts in some new laws. One of the laws is that the plebeians will be able to appeal any political decision that is made. The right to appeal is called provocatio. And also the idea that any man declaring himself king or conspiring to become a king is to be executed immediately. We've seen already from this story that although the Roman Republic is still young, it is not to be trifled with. Superbus has gone to get the aid of two quite powerful cities, the Veii and the Tarquini, and even so he is still not able to defeat the new and young Roman Republic and its people. So how have things, how have things changed and how have, have things stayed the same so far in the story? It's difficult to say because any progress that's to be made by the plebeians has been hampered by this new set of wars, the Romano-Etruscan war between the fledgling republic and the previous king, Tarquinius Superbus. There is a distinct lack of political rights for the plebeians. Having said that, Valerius brings in these two new laws. So what has changed? There are notable Roman characters that come to the fore that represent the Roman Republic with their courage and their bravery and their forward thinking. Despite never having a Republic before, they seem to have the right idea of what to do and how to set it up effectively. Brutus dies as a martyr against the regime of monarchy for the Republic. So you have to wonder how much Brutus has actually done. Yes, he is a symbolic death that the rest of the Republic can now use as to hold up as a uh, an image of purity for the Roman Republic. But how much of these events were precipitated by the actions of the Etruscan kings themselves? Valerius is given the name Publicola, the people's friend. Despite the rumour that he wanted to make himself king, he put those rumours to rest by his behaviour that followed. The word king has become so deeply taboo that anyone conspiring to make themselves a king can be executed. And finally, the plebeians have got the right to appeal any new law that is made by the Senate, a right called provocatio. OK, so that rounds up the beginning of the Republic and the Battle of Silver Asia. I will hope you'll tune in for the next episode. Thank you very much for watching and listening.